All right. I'm back at it. Okay, you ready? Me starting with chapter one, the last of the Gulfs. It reads, when the armies of Alexander the Great were trampling upon the ancient empires of the East, one country remained undisturbed and undismayed. The people of Arabia sent no humble embassies to the conqueror. Alexander resolved to bring the contemptuous Arabs to his feet. He was preparing to evade their land when death laid its hand upon him and the Arabs remained unconquered. There was more than 300 years, this was more than 300 years before Christ. And even then, Arabs had been, had long been established in independence in their great desert peninsula for nearly For nearly a thousand years more, they continued to dwell there in a strange solitude. Great, exam great empires sprang up, up around them. My fault. Great empires sprang up around them. The success of Alexander founded the Assyrian kingdom of the, Seleuci the Seleucids and the Egyptian dynasty of the Ptolemies. Augustus was crowned. In Peretorate, Rome, Constantine became the first Christian emperor at Byzantine. The hordes of the barbarian bore down upon the wide reaching provinces of the Caesars, and still the Arabs remained undisturbed, undisturbed, unexplored, and unsubdued. Their frontier cities might pay homage to the Choros and the or Caesar, the legions of Rome might once and again flash across their highland wastes, but such inference was faint and the trans transitory and left the Arabs unmoved. Himed in as they were by lands ruled by the historic dynasties, their desert and their valor ke ever kept out of the invader and from the days of remote antiquity to the 7th century of the Christian era, hardly anything was known of this secluded people, save that they existed and that no one attacked them with impunity. Then suddenly, a change came of the character of the Arabs. No longer courting seclusion, they came forth before the world and proceeded in good earnest to conquest it. The change had been only by one man, Muhammad the Arabian, the Arabian prophet began to preach the religion of Islam in the beginning of the seventh century, and his doctrine followed upon a people prone to pick a people prone to quick impulses and susceptible of strong impressions, worked a revolution. When he taught what he taught was simple enough. He took the old faith of the Hebrews, which had his disciples in Arabia and making such additions and alterations as he thought needful, he preached the worship of one God as a new revelation to a nation of idolatrous. It is difficult for us to, in this present time to understand the irresistible impulse which the simple and unemotional creed of Muhammad gave to the whole people of Arabia, but we know that such religious revolution might have been and that there is always a mysterious a mysterious and potent fascination in the personal influence of a prophet. Muhammad was far more true that he taught honestly and strangely what he believed to be only right faith and there is enough of sublimity in the creed yeah. excuse me of the creed and of enthusiasm and the prophet and his hearers to his to produce the wave of overmastering popular feeling which people call fanaticism. The Arabs before the time Muhammad had been a collective of rival tribes or clans excelling in savage virtues of bravery, hospitality, even chivalry, and devoted to the pursuit of booty. The prophet, Mo, prophet turned the Arabs' trash for the Nas into Muslim people, Muslim people, 
fill them with the fever of martyrs and add it to the greed of plunder, the nobler, the nobler ambition of bringing all mankind to the knowledge. Okay, so let me. I just want to make a note here for you guys. Uh, Arabia used to be c controlled by Ethiopia, so I would I would say that it it wasn't savagery because these are also African people, but. Not to respect the author, just a side note. Uh, the Queen of Sheba controlled Ethiopia. And most people say the Ethiopia culture was very close to African spirituality. Okay, we'll get to that later. Just want to touch on that. Before Muhammad died, he was master of Arabia and united the tribes who embraced the Muslims. And the Muhammadan faith were already spread over the neighboring lands and subduing the astonished nations. Under his successors, the Caliphs. The army of Muslims overran Persia and Egypt and North Africa as far as the Pillars of Hercules. And the Muslims chanted the call to prayer to the faithful over all the land from the river Oxus in the Central Asia to the shores of the Atlantic. The Mohammedans or Saracens, we know from, um, look, it's a word mean Eastern. So Eastern is Africa. Or uh, we know also Saracens means uh, Hebrew. So we also have the Saracens. Saracens means Saracens. Were checked in Asia Minor by the forces of the Greek emperor. And it was not till the 15th century that they at last obtained the long coveted possession of Constantinople by the valor of the Ottoman Turks. So too, as the opposite extremity of the Mediterranean, it was an officer of the Greek emperor who, for a while, held the Arab advance in check. The conqueror swept over the provinces of North Africa and after a long struggle reduced the turbulent Berber tribes for a while to submission to only the fortress of Kuwait held out against. Them, like the rest of the southern shore of the Mediterranean, Kuwait belonged to the Greek emperor, but it was far removed from Constantinople. That it was thrown upon the neighboring kingdoms of Spain for support. And while it's still nominally under the authority of the emperor, looked really to the king of Toledo for assistance and protection, it is not likely that all the aid that Spain could have given would have availed against the surging tide of the Saracen invasion. But it, as it happened, there was a quarrel at the time between Julian the governor of Coita and Roderick the king of Spain, which opened the door to the Arabs. Spain was under fire. I'm sorry, Spain was under the rule. Hold on my hand real quick. Spain was under the rule of the Visigoths, or the West Goths, a tribe of barbarians, like the many others who overran the provinces of the Roman Empire in its decline. The Ostrogoths had occupied Italy, and their kinsmen, the Visigoths, displacing or subduing Suvi, Swasabins, or rural German tribes, established themselves in Roman province in Iberia, Spain, in the 5th century, after Christ, they found the country in the same condition of infeminate luxury and degeneracy that had proved the ruin of the ruin of other parts of the empire. Like many warlike people, the Romans, when their work was accomplished and the world was at their feet, had rested contentedly from their labors and abandoned themselves to the pleasure that the wealth and security permit. They were no longer the brave, stern man who lived simple lives and left prong share to the will, sword, when a Scipio or a Caesar summoned them to defend their country or to a conqueror or to conquer a continent. In Spain, the richer class were given over to luxury and sensuality. They lived only for eating and drinking and gambling and all kinds of assignment. The mass of the people were either slaves or what was much the same thing, laborers bound to the soil, who could not be detached from the land they cultivated, but passed with it from master to master between the rich and the slave was a middle class of burghers, who perhaps even worse off for their shoulder lay 
all the burden of supporting the state. They paid taxes, performed the civil and municipal functions, and supplied the money where the rich squandered upon the luxuries. In a society so demoralized, there were no elements of the opposition to a resolute invader. The, no, the wealthy nobles were too deeply absorbed in their pleasures to be easily roused by the rumors by rumors of an enemy. Their souls were rusty with being too long laid aside. The slaves felt little interest in a change in masters, which could hardly make them more miserable than they already were. And the burghers were discontented with the arrangement of the burden of the state by which they had to bear most of the costs while they reaped none of the, the advantages. Out of such men as these, a strong and resolute army could not be formed. The Visigoths therefore entered Spain with little trouble. Armies opened their gates and diseased civilization of Roman Spain yielded with, a, with hardly a blow. The truth was that the role of the Goths had been too well prepared by the previous hordes of barbarians, aliens, vandal, suvis, to need much assertion of their own. The Romanized Spaniards have fully learned what a barbarian invasion, invasion entailed. They had seen their cities burn, their wave and children carry captives. Those few leaders who show are mainly, mainly resistance massacre. They had seen the consequences of the barbarian scourge, plague and famine, wasted land, starving inhabitants, and everywhere. Savage, savage anarchy. They had learned their lessons and meekly admitted the Gulfs. In the beginning of the 8th century, when the Serapians had reached the African shore, now remember, the Saracens are Africans, so let's keep that in note. The Saracens are African. The Atlantic reached the shore of Africa and the Atlantic. Looking across the Straits of Hercules to the sunny provinces of Andalusia, the Goths had been in possession of Spain for more than 200 years. There had been some time, some time enough to reform the corruption, the, to reform the corrupt condition of the kingdom, and to infuse vigor of the youth, which in old civilization seems, some, which in old civilization sometimes gains by the introduction of barbarous and masculine races. There were special reasons why the Goths should improve the state of Spain. They were not only bold and strong and corrupted by the ease of life, they were Christians, and in their way very earnest Christians. Spain was nominally converted at the time of their arrival. Constantine had indeed promulgated Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire, which had taken very little root in the western provinces. The advent of an ignorant but devout race of like, like the Goths probably arose a more earnest faith in the new religion amid the worn out paganism of the kingdom. And the Catholic priests were full of hope for the future of the church. The result did not in any way justify the anticipation. The Goths remained devout indeed. They were regarded, but they regarded their acts of religion chiefly as reparations for their vices. They compounded for exceptionally bad sins by an added amount of repentance. They then sinned again without compunction. They were quite as corrupt and immoral as the Roman nobles who had preceded them and their style of Christianity did not lead them to endeavor to improve the conditions of their subject. The serfs were in, were in an even more pitiable state than before. Not only were they tied to the land or masters, they could not marry without his consent and if slaves of neighboring estates intermarried, their children were distributed, distributed between the owners of several properties, mid classes bought, as in Roman times, and burden of taxation were consequently bankrupt and ruined, and the land was still in the hands of a few, and large estates were indefinitely cultivated by crowds of miserable states whose dreary. I just want to, I just want to touch on that too. Now you see how it's telling you about how they was enslaved, how 
in Europe. We do, we, but we do know that Rome was not just all Europeans. We do know they had a, a lot of so-called black people there. But you just see how even Rome was a slave society. So when they come in acting like, oh, only people ever in history been slaves to us. No, they came from a slave society too. Okay. So we'll talk, talk about that later. Okay, lives were brightened by no hope of improvement or dream of release before death. The very clergy who preached about the brotherhood of Christians, now that they had become rich and on great estates, joined in the traditional policy and treated their slaves and serfs as badly as Roman noble. The rich were sunk in the same slough of sensuality, sensuality that had proved the ruin of the Romans and the vices of the Christian Goths rival, if they did not exceed in polished, exceed the polished witnesses, witness, witnesses, witness of the pagans. King Witiza says chronicler anxious to find reasons for the overthrow of the Christians by the Saracens. My fault, I said again. King Wit Witiza says the chronicler, anxious to find some reason for the overthrow of the Christians by the Saracens, taught all Spain to sin. Spain indeed knew only too well how to sin before Wit Witiza may have been no remorse than his predecessors. But the Gulf gave, but the Gulf gave a fresh license to the general corruptions. The vices of the barbarians show often a close resemblance to those of decayed civilization. And in this instance, the change of rulers brought no amelorations or, or morals. Hmm. Such was the condition of Spain when the Muslim men approached her borders. A corrupt aristocracy divided the land among themselves. The greatest states were tilled by a wretched and hopeless race of serfs, and citizen class were ruined. On the other side of the Straits of Gibraltar were soldiers of Islam, all hardy warriors, fired with the fever of a new faith, bred to arms from their childhood, simple and rude in their life, and eager to plunge the rich lands of the infidels. Between two such peoples, there could be no doubt as to the, as to the issue of the fight. But to remove the possibility of doubt, treachery came to the aid of the invaders. Witiza had been disposed by Roderick, a prince who seems to have begun his reign well, but who presently succumbed to the temptations of wealth and power. <laughs> Pleasure, loving that position, set fire to the combustible materials that that surrounded him, and that needed but a spark to explode and destroy his kingdom. It was then the custom among the princes of the state to send their children to the court to be trained in whatever appertained to good breeding and polite conduct. Among others, Count Julian Guler. Governor of Kuwait sent his daughter Flor Florinda, <laughs> very like close to Florida, right? To Roderick Court at Toledo to be educated among the Queen's waiting women. The maiden was very brutal, and the king, forgetful of this honor which bound him to protect her as he would his own daughter, put her to shame. The dishonor was greater, the, the dishonor was the greater since Julian's wife was a daughter of Witzesai in the royal blood of the Goths had thus had thus been insulted in the poor person of Florinda. In her distress, the young girl wrote to her father and summoning a trusting page, bade him if he hoped for kind for knightly honor or lady's favor to speed with all haste, night and day, over land and sea, till he placed the letter in Count Julian's hand. Julian had no reason to love Roderick. His own connection with the disposed and probably murdered King Witizoff forbade fellowship with the usurper, and his daughter with dishonor feigned him smoldering rancor to a blaze of vengeful fury. To a blaze of vengeful, vengeful fury. He had so far successfully resisted 
attacks of the Arabs, but now he resolved no longer to defend the kingdom of his daughter destroyer. See, look, you see how he's like, hey, I'm not even helping them no more. They didn't rape my daughter. The Saracens should have Spain if they would, and he was ready to show them the way. <laughs> full, a, full of a passion of revenge, Julian hastened to the court of Roderick, where he is so skillfully disguised his mind that the king, who felt some remorse and trusted that Flor Florinda had kept, kept the secret, heaped honors upon him, took his counsel and everything relating to the defense of the kingdom, and even by his treacherous advice sent the best horses and arms in Spain to the south under Julian's command to be ready against the infidel invaders. Count Julian departed from Toledo in the highest favor of the king, taking his daughter with him. You see, he came and showed him love, like, no, nah, I got something for this dude. Oh, you raped my daughter, so I'm just giving you context. Roderick's pardon request was that the Count would send him some special kinds of hawks, which he needed for hunting. Roger made the answer that he would bring him such hawks as he had never in his life seen before, and with this converting hint of the coming of Arabs, he went back to Kuwait. <laughs> See? You don't do wrong to people. As soon as he had returned, he paid a visit to Musa. Now, what we heard the name Musa before? So this is before King Mansa Musa even existed. He had somebody named Musa, right? The son of Nozira. So here you got somebody named Musa in Arab in North Africa, with whom his with whom his trips had troops had many times crossed swords, and he told him that the war was now over between them. Okay, that's my fault. The walls between them. Henceforth, they must be friends. Then he filled the ears of the Arab generals with stories of beauty and richness of Spain. And its rivers and pastures, vines and olives. Its splendid cities and palaces and treasures of the Gulf. It was a land flowing of with milk and honey, he said. And Musa had only to go over and take it. Julian himself would show him the way and lend him and lend him the ships. The Arabs were a cautious the Arabs was a cautious general. However, this invited proposal he considered. Might cover a treacherous amb ambuscade. So he sent messages to his master, the caliphs in Damascus, to ask for instructions and meantime contented himself with sending a small body of 500 men under Tarif in, seven, in 17 to make a raid in Julian's four ships upon the request upon the coast of Andalusia. The Arabs had not yet become used to the navigation of the Mediterranean. And Musa was unwilling to expose more than a significant part of his enemy, of his army, to the perils of the deep. Now we don't worry about that because we know that the Arabs already had ships with Queen of Sheba and all that. But we will really take the Arthur perspective from it. Tarif returned in July, having successfully accomplished his mission. See, that's called Renaissance, that Renaissance. He basically said he went over there and checked it out. Okay, let's see where we at. Completed his mission. He landed at the at the place which still bears his name. Talifa. Talfa. Had plundered out Jasiras and sent enough to shoot him. <laughs> to assure him that Count Julian's tale of the defenseless state of Spain was true. And that his own loyalty to the invaders was dependent upon, was to be dependent upon. Still, Musa was not disposed to venture much upon the new conquest. The Caliph of Damascus had enjoined him on no account to risk the whole Muslim army in unknown da dangers, and, uh, and had only authorized small foray expeditions. Still, encouraged by Tarif's success, Musa resolved 
upon a somewhat larger venture. In 711, learning that Roderick was busy in the north of his dominions, where, where there was a rising of Basques, Musa dispatched one of his generals, the Moor Tariq, with 7,000 troops, and most of them were also Moors, to make another raid upon Andalusia. The raid carried him further than expected. Tariq landed at the Lion's Rock, which has ever since bore his name. The word Moor is conveniently used to signify Arabs and other Mohammedans in Spain, but it probably should be applied to Berbers of North Africa and Spain. In this volume, the term is used to in its common exception unless Arabs are specifically distinguished from the Berbers. Now, to bring this to account, black people are Moors. Black people are original Arabs, the original Africans, the original people in America, you are the Berbers. You are the original Christians, you are the original Mohammedans, so, so let's keep that in context. But when we say more, we mean the black people. So I don't want you to be confused when you hear the author say that. This, this in early 18, I mean 1900, so there's a lot of stuff going on. But this is so-called black African history, okay? So I want you to know that as we move along. Don't get confused, because we are the Arabs. Um, Jebel Tariq, the Gibraltar. And after conquering Cartaya, advanced inland, he had not proceeded far when he perceived the whole force of the Gulfs under Roderick advancing to counsel him. The two armies met on the bank of a little river called by the Saracens, the Wadi Becca, near Guadalate, which runs into the Straits of Cape Trifa. Agar. Now, as I'm reading this note, I'm pacing myself, but as you hear, this is a, let's, in modern terms, this is about to be a battle between white and black people. Saracens are black people, Roderick and the Gulfs are so-called white people. So just put it in the context for you in case you kind of get confused as we go along. The legend runs that sometime before his death, be, sometime before this, as King Roderick was seated on his throne in the ancient city of Toledo, Two old men entered the audience chamber. They were arrayed in white robes of the ancient maid, and their girdles were adorned in the signs of the zodiac and hung with innumerable keys. No old king said they that in days of yore, when Hercules had set up his pillars at the ocean strait. Now Hercules, if you know the history, he loved to go to Ethiopia. So let's put that in the zodiac. Also comes out of Africa. So I'm just getting context to you as we move along at the ocean straits. He erected a strong tower near the ancient city of Toledo and shut up within it a magical spell secured by a ponderous iron gate with locks of steel. And he ordained that every new king should set a fresh lock to the portal and he and foretold woe and destruction to him who should seek to unravel the mystery of the tower. Now we and our ancestors have kept the door of the tower from the days of Hercules even to this hour. And though they have been kings who have sought to discover the secret, therein has ever been deaf and sore amazement. None have none ever penetrated beyond the threshold. Now, O king, we come to beg thee to affix thy lock upon the enchanted tower, as all kings before thee have done, whereupon the aged man departed. But Roderick, when he had thought of all they had said became filled with a burning desire to enter. This spot. So that, that's this that must be the area they're talking about right there. You can see. Enchanted Tower. And despite warnings of his bishops and counselors who told him again that none had ever entered the tower alive. And that even great Caesar had not dared to attempt the entrance, nor should it ever ope, old records say, save to a king the last of all his line, what time his empire ties to decay. And treason digs beneath her fatal mines, and high above impends avenging wrath divine. Despite all admonitions, he rode forth one day accompanied by his cavaliers and approached the tower. It stood to a lofty rock and cliff and precipice hemmed in it. 
Its walls were of jasper and marble and laid in subtle devices which shone in the rays of the sun. The entrance was through a passage cut. In stone, and was closed by the great iron gate covered. The great iron gate covered with the rusty locks, with the rusty rusty locks of the centuries of all the centuries, from the time of Hercules to Wittesa. And on either hand stood the aged men who had come to the audience hall. All day long did the two old janitors, though forbidding ill, aided by Roderick's happy cavaliers gave me happy cavaliers labeled to turn the rusty keys until when it, it was near sundown the gate was undone and the king and his train advanced to the entrance the gate swung back and they entered a hall on the other side which guarding a second door stood a gigantic bronze figure of terrible aspect which yielded a huge mace unseemly and dealt mighty blows upon the earth um, upon the earth round so it's like they told him, don't go in here because people have died for going in his tower. And he's like, hey, I got to see it. He don't even care about what people were saying. And he saw something. When, when, when Roderick saw this figure, he was dismayed a while. But seeing on his breast the words, I do my duty, he plucked up courage and conquered it to let him pass in safety. For he meant no sacrilege, but only wished to learn the mystery of the tower. Then, then the figure, the figure stood still, with his mace uplifted, and the king and his followers passed beneath it into the second chamber. They found this and crushed it with precious stones, and in it, midst was a table set there by Hercules, and on it a casket with inscription, and this coffer is the mystery of the tower. The hand of none but a king shall open it, but let him beware, for wonderful things will be disclosed to him, which must happen between but much, much, much happened before his death. When the king op the, opened the coffer, there was nothing in it but a parchment folded between two plates of copper. On it were figured men on the horseback, figure, fierce of countenance, armed with bows and scimitars. And above them was the motto, Behold, rash man, those who shall hur hurl thee from thy throne and subdue thy kingdom. As they gazed upon the picture on a sudden on a sudden they heard the sound of warfare and saw a saw as though a cloud that the figure the strange horseman began to move and the picture became a vision of war so to say rather I or to spread successful pageants filled the mystic scene showing the fate of battles ere they blood and the events that had not had not been that behold before them a great battle, a great field of battle where Christians and Moors, okay, let me say now, Europeans made history religious. So when they say Christians, they're saying they're the Christians. But really, I mean, Europeans, Christians and Moors mean European, white people and black people. White people are claiming to be Christians and black people are the Moors. So behold, it was a great battle between white and black people were engaged in a deadly conflict. They heard the rush and tramp of steed and the blast of trump and clarion and the clash of cymbal and the stormy din of a thousand drums. There was the flash of sword and maces and battle axes and with the whistling of arrows and hurling of darts and lances. Christians quelled before the, 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 the foe. One second, I have to change my hand. Christians quelled before the foe. The infidels pressed upon them and put them to other route. The standard of the cross was cast down and the banner of Spain was trodden underfoot. The air resounded with a shout of trumpet, with yells of fury, and with the groans of dying men amidst the flying squadrons, kings, squadrons, King Rodder beheld a crown royal, whose back was turned toward him, but whose armor and device were his own and who was mounted on a white steed that resembled his own war horse Aurelia. In the confusion of the fight, the warrior was dismounted and was no longer to be seen, and Aurelia galloped wildly through the field of battle without a rider. When the king and his attendants fled dismayed from their China, when the king and his attendants fled dismayed from their China Tower, the great bronze vigor disappeared. <laughs>
Now look about that. They said the great bronze figure. So they it, it seemed like they said it was a either this guy had had on bronze or if his skin was bronze as a, as a brother. So let's put that in context. The two aged janitors lay dead at the entrance, and amid various stormy portents of nature, the tower burst into a blaze, and every stone was consumed and scattered into the winds. And it is related that wherever its ashes fell to the earth, that was seen a drop of blood. Woo! Okay, I'm off. Let me get this together for y'all. The medieval chronicles, both Christian and Arab, delighted to relate potency of such deeds, legend and vision, potency and sign, were wonders of wild Arabsis, Arabsquis combined with gothic imagery of a darker shade. Huh? They say right there, a darker shade. They're trying to tell you something, black people. And we read how both sides of the approaching combat were cheered or dismayed by the omens of various kinds. The prophet himself is said to have appeared to Tyreek and to have bidden him to be of good courage, to strike and to conquer. And many like fables are related. But whatever may have been the dreams and vision of the armies then a camp against one another near the river. Let me turn real quick. I'm turning my body so much I can just... Near the river of Gualate, the result of the combat was never doubted. Tariq indeed, although he had been reinforced with 5,000 Berbers, which are more Africans, commanded still but a little army of 12,000 troops. Roderick had six times as many men to his back. But the invaders were boldly and hardy men and used war and led by a hero. The Spaniards were a crowd of illiterate slaves and among their commanders were treacherous nobles. The kinsmen of Widdiska were there in obedience to the summons of Roderick. So there you have when people say, oh, it's more of them than us. Here you have them six times more, and we about to conquer Spain. So that lets you know, don't let nobody ever tell you that numbers and sometimes mean that much. It's about heart. But they intended to desert the army sides in the midst of the battle and win the day for the Saracens. The Saracens are the Moors. But they had no idea that they were betraying Spain. They thought the invaders were only in search of booty and that the array over the booty secure, they will go back to Africa with when the Lion of Wissakar would be destroyed to its ancient seat, and thus they had lent a hand to the day's work, which placed the fairest provinces of Spain for eight centuries under the Muslim domination. When the Moors saw the mighty army that Roderick had brought themselves against them, that had brought against had when the Moors saw well hold on, let's back up real quick. Okay, when they say he was portraying Spain and with, with this guy, he, this got to be a brother. If not, something happened because we know that Spain is part of Africa. We know uh, King Tahark of Nubia controlled Spain. Spain was part of Carthage. So let's, let's not act like Spain was some European country. Just to get that context. Okay, when the Moors saw the mighty army that Roderick had brought against them and beheld the king in his splendid armor under a magnificent canopy, their hearts for a moment sunk within them. But Tariq cried aloud. Cried aloud. Man, before you is the army and the sea is at your back. But Allah, there is no escape for you. Save in valor and resolution. And they plucked up courage and shouted, We will follow thee, O Tariq and rush after their general into fray. The battle lasted a whole week, and prodigies of valor were recorded on both sides. Roderick rallied his army again and again, but the distortion of the partisans of Widdizah turned the fortune of the field and became a scene of the disastrous routes. The host of Don Regal were scattered in the May. When, the, when loss was the A battle, no heart, no hope had they. He, when he saw that the field was lost and all his hope was flown, he turned him from flying host and took his way alone. <laughs> all stained and strewed with dust and blood like the sun smoldering brand. Plucked from fire, Rodrigo showed his sword, 
was in his hand, but it was hacked into a saw of dark and purple tint. His jewel mail had many a flaw, his helmet many a dent. Mm. He climbed into a hilltop, the highest he can see. Dense all about that wide route, his long last, his last long look took key. He saw his royal banners, where they were laid drenched and turned. He heard the cry of victory, the Abraham shot of scorn. He looked for the brave captains that led the host of Spain. But all were fled except the dead, and who could count the slain? This is a nice poem. Where his eye could wander, all bloody was plain. And while thus he said, the tears he shed ran down his cheeks like rain. Last night I was the king of Spain, today king am no king am I. Last night fair castles held my train, tonight where shall I lie? Last night a hundred pages did serve me a knee. Tonight not one I call my own, not one pertains to me. O oh, luckless, luckless was the hour and cursed was the day when I was born to have power of this great seigniory. Unhappy me I have shown, shall the sun go down tonight? O oh, death, why now so slow art thou? Why fearest thou to smite? So runs the old Spanish ballad, ballad. The fate of Roderick has remained a mystery to this day. His horse and saddles were found on the river bank the day after the battle, but his body was not with them. Doubtless he was drowned and washed out to the great ocean, but the Spaniards would not believe this. They clothed the dead king with a holy mystery which assuredly did not enfold him when alive. They made the last of the Visigoths into a legendary savior like King Arthur and believed that he would come again from his resting place from the in some ocean isle healed of his wound to lead the Christians once like King Arthur. They believed that he would come again from his resting place in some ocean isle healed of his wound to lead the Christians once more against the infidels. In Spanish legends, Roderick spent most of his life in pious acts of penitence and was slowly devoured by snakes in punishment for the sins he had committed until his last crime was washed out. The body pain had spared, his, spared the spirit pain and Don Rodrigo was suffered to depart the peaceful isle whence his countryman long awaited his triumph return.